first off, thank you guys so much for, uh, for having me back to uh, Mumbai again. Uh, I had a fantastic time here last year, and I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, if you have any, uh, any questions or want to talk to me about anything, I'm around all day today, all day tomorrow, uh, so please let me know. In, uh, in watching all of these uh, great presentations this morning, I realized that uh, they've pretty much told you everything that I'm going to tell you. So, I'm going to try to uh, still give you something new and interesting. This thing's very loud. Uh, and, uh, you know, if uh, I, I might skip through some stuff, but, uh, yeah, we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I am Sam Hotchkiss. Uh, I am the Jetpack team lead at Automatic. Uh, I have worked on a number of different plugins in the past, including Brute Protect, which uh, I helped build from zero to 100,000 users in about 10 months. Uh, so we were pretty proud of that. Uh, of the top 20 WordPress plugins out there in the repo, I've committed code or worked with the team on five of them. Uh, so I have a fair amount of experience with higher traffic plugins. I ran an agency for 10 years, and I like to take pictures sometimes. Before I get into it, we are hiring at Automatic. So uh, definitely come up to our booth. You can work from anywhere. We have amazing, passionate people. Uh, you can work on products used by about 102 million people between WordPress.com and Jetpack. Uh, we pay no matter where you are in the world. We pay uh, US level salaries, uh, unlimited paid vacation, multiple paid trips to different countries every year. Uh, and you can apply at automatic.com slash jobs or come talk to any of us. Now, before I get in, I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to contradict myself. Because in dealing with anything, with plugins, with business, with building, building any of these models out, it's about finding the right balance. Right, so I'm going to tell you, do this, but actually don't do this. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do my best to try and help you navigate where that line is, but everyone's path is different. Uh, so, excuse me in advance. So, <clears throat> part the first of this talk, we're going to go over development best practices. So we're going to talk a little bit about code. We're going to get into uh, just, just a few little code examples. But I'm going to try not to get too heavy into it. I don't want, uh, if you're not a developer, I don't want you to feel like, uh, you know, you need to go. Uh, I will try and get you to lunch as quickly as possible. So, <clears throat> this text is very small. <laughs> First thing we're going to talk about is version control. As you're building a plugin, it's really important uh, that you start it out in version control. Don't think of that as something you're going to add on later. It, it provides a lot of value. Uh, and you can use GitHub for free if you're going to have an open source product. No problem. Uh, if you're not, uh, you can use something like Bitbucket or Beanstalk, uh, which are really useful tools for uh, housing your code and pretty affordable. Uh, and even if it's just you, if you're not working with the team, it, it, you know, you're just working on it on your own, use version control. If it's just you, you can host uh, Git locally on your machine. You don't need to push it anywhere. But having that history of the changes in your files is going to be really useful. And once your pl plugin starts picking up steam and you have uh, you know, more people who you're working with, you can push that up and they can see the natural evolution of your code. <clears throat> this is our code control process for Jetpack. Uh, is this readable for you guys? Kind of? OK. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to sort of look through here. So uh, you know, the green here, uh, green dots indicate different branches within our, uh, within our repo. Uh, the uh, blue are pull requests, and then uh, the, they are in gray bubbles, are uh, uh, manual processes. So, you know, everything, uh, everything that makes it into master has to first be in a pull request. And whether that's coming from inside our team or external as a user submitted pull request. We have a naming convention that we use for... Uh, the, the branches that we as the developers on the Jetpack team create. So it might be fix slash whatever the issue is, enhance slash whatever the issue is uh, to uh, you know, give us a, a 
easy reference as to whether or not we're fixing an existing problem or creating a new feature, right? So that's gonna go uh, once we feel like it's ready either to get more reviews or maybe ready to merge, then uh, that's gonna go into a pull request. Any code before it goes into master has to have two code reviews. So our goal is to have three sets of eyes on every line of code that makes it into the plugin. The developer, the first code reviewer, and the second code reviewer. Now, ideally, and especially with larger features, both code reviewers will give it a full test. In practice, sometimes we're short on time. At least one person needs to give it a full test, and the other person needs to read through the code uh, and have a good understanding of what it's doing and how it's going to work. So once we do, we've done that and we move it over into the master branch, uh, our master branch we, we treat uh, kind of differently from a lot of projects. We treat master uh, as a staging ground for master stable because we have a grunt process that we run against master before it goes into stable and that compiles all of our SAS uh, and makes sure that we don't have any issues. It runs all of our unit tests, uh, so on and so forth. So, you know, normally what will happen is uh, someone will go through and do a batch of second reviews. They will accept those PRs uh, into master. They'll pull down master locally, grunt, let that process run, rebase master stable onto master, so we've, we've pulled all that down. And then, uh, that master stable branch, we'll talk about it a little more uh, in, in a few minutes, but uh, we have a beta plugin out there that's open to anyone in the community who wants to run our bleeding edge that pulls from master stable. So once we update master stable, that pushes out to everyone who's running our, uh, our beta plugin. Then as we're getting closer to a release, uh, we'll start tagging betas. Uh, normally we do sort of one to three tag betas in a release cycle. Those push out to people who are running the beta plugin but say, you know, I really want it to be more stable. Uh, so, you know, they're not getting, uh, you know, the equivalent of nightlies. They're getting the equivalent of beta versions. Uh, and so, once we tag there, all of this process is happening GitHub. Now we touch uh, uh, Subversion and the uh, uh, the WordPress.org plugin repo for the first time and move it over there. So it's really important when you're going through and building these plugins that you pay attention to security. I'm not going to go through all of the things that you need to do to be secure. Uh, you are all extremely smart people and uh, I, I will have uh, a list of resources available by the end of the day tomorrow that include a bunch of links that go along with all of these slides. So you can go through, I'll have links on uh, some different places you can learn, uh, you know, more in depth what you need to do to be secure. But highlights are secure your input, escape your output, use nonces, control user access, this is really important. Don't give users access to do things beyond the scope of their role within WordPress. Right, always check to make sure that you're giving users the least amount of permission possible. Uh, and like I said, the basics aren't that hard, but they are very, very important. Next thing you wanna make sure you're doing when you're building an awesome plugin as to not break people's sites is namespace everything. So don't call, it, don't call your class trash cleanup. Call it SAP trash cleanup. Uh, or whatever your, uh, you know, your, your name sp namespace prefix is for your plugin. Uh, and make sure that, uh, you know, you, you're trying to pick something that is as unique as possible. SAP underscore probably actually wouldn't be a, a, a good prefix to use uh, because it would be pretty easy for someone else to collide with that. Uh, this doesn't just apply to classes, it also applies to any functions that aren't wrapped inside a class. Write readable code. So uh, you know, in the Jetpack project, we really like to follow the code standards of uh, WordPress.org. So we make our code look as close to .org code as possible, which means lots and lots and lots of spaces, new lines. They, it really likes to spread things out. 
but it makes it way, way more readable, right? Use descriptive names uh, for variables, not letters, uh, in, except in uh, you know, situations where it's very compact and readable. Uh, this block down below, much, much more readable than the block above. Does the same thing. It's also really important to focus on performance. You know, as your plugin grows and you start getting more and more users, let's say you want to be running on larger and larger sites, performance doesn't matter for small sites, uh, it, for the most part. People who have, you know, 10, 15, 20 hits a day don't really care if, uh, you know, your, your code is a, a real memory hog, is taking up a bunch of RAM because, you know, the, uh, at that scale, uh, not really a factor. But as more and more people start to use your plugin, this is going to become more and more of an issue. So watch that you're not using extraneous queries. You can do a lot with WP debug and uh, debug bar to, uh, uh, to see what queries are running on the front end, what queries are running on the back end. Minimize that. Uh, really make sure that you're not using non-cacheable queries for logged out users. Uh, so when a user is logged out, any query that you have to make on the front end, we should be able to cache so that you're not having to hit the database every time. Uh, you know, minimize your front end markup images, CSS, JavaScript. Don't put in a ton of stuff that's going to load into the front end if it's not really necessary. You want to make sure on every page load that, that you're really targeted in what you're including. Uh, you can use transients to help with caching custom data. Uh, with, uh, with Brute Protect, we, we made heavy use of transients uh, because it, you know, it allowed us to quickly uh, get at that custom data we needed. Also, P3 Profiler can be really good in testing, uh, testing the load time of your site, testing uh, you know, everything that's involved in loading a page. <coughs> Include hooks and make your text translatable. Bryce hit on this. Uh, it's really important that you take uh, anything that's being spit out through the front end and make sure that your users have the ability to modify it if there might be any reason for them to do that. Also, obviously, India, India is a country with many languages, so you understand the importance of translations better than most of the world. But it's very, very easy when you're building a plugin to make it translatable. It's very, uh, very much a headache later on to go through and try and wrap everything, make sure you don't break it. Make your UI as simple as possible. So it's really easy uh, to jam lots and lots of features into a plugin so that it does everything that everyone needs. Uh, it's a much better route to go through and uh, use hooks, use filters to allow people to extend that. Uh, you can even build in those features, but only make them activated uh, through the code rather than through the user interface. Uh, one of my favorite quotes was, uh, I didn't have time to write a, write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. It's very, very easy to put in every, every option. So think about what you're building into your user interface, and that's going to make for happier users. Time spent writing code, quality code is never time wasted. That said, I'm not saying perfect code. You could spend all day, all week, all year writing perfect code and never get it released. But you can spend a little bit of extra time writing quality code that's going to be useful to people for a long time to come. Okay. The other thing that you want to look at, and uh, I'm dragging a little bit, so I'm going to speed up here, but uh, unit tests uh, can really help in getting your, uh, getting your code to be high quality as you move forward. Uh, you can use unit tests really well with continuous integration tools. For Jetpack, we use Travis CI, which ties into GitHub. When you commit, we run it through Travis, which checks it against uh, a couple different versions of PHP to make sure that we don't have any incompatibilities with older versions. Uh, and it, it runs all of our unit tests. Uh, we use PHP unit and Q unit to uh, unit test our JavaScript. Uh, make sure that you are, uh, you know, at least as you're starting, consider using test-driven development, where when you're developing a new feature, 
first you write the unit test, and then you write the, uh, uh, the feature so that it satisfies the unit test. Uh, that can be the easiest way to make sure that you have good unit tests moving forward. Manual testing, obviously also important. Uh, the way that we, uh, we do things, we have an auto deploy. Uh, whenever GitHub Master Stable gets updated, that pushes out to a number of different testing servers so that we can do manual testing right there. Uh, we've rolled our own with GitHub webhooks. For client work in the past, I've used Beanstalk extensively uh, and deploy.io is, is uh, their partner company which will on commit push to different servers and you can set up different rules for that. Uh, make sure that before every release you walk through all of your, co your common user actions to make sure that you're not missing anything. Set up a new site from scratch, reinstall from scratch. I've seen many times in the past where people have run into issues because uh, you know, there might have been uh, an error committed in the activation script. They never see it because they're just updating a plugin that's already installed. So start over from scratch, make sure you catch everything. Occasionally issues are gonna slip through. It's gonna happen. Uh, you're gonna have bugs, you're gonna have to make emergency releases. Uh, I did one from the uh, lobby of our hotel three days ago. Uh, it happens. So do everything you can to minimize them, but don't beat yourself up when it does happen. And get your users in on it. It's great to have an open beta program where your users can come in, help you test, help you, uh, you know, they can be a part of your process. And it creates users who have a personal investment in making your product better, which creates promoters for your brand, which we're gonna talk about here in just a minute. Develop, release, iterate. Okay, quickly try and get to a minimum viable product. Get it out the door, get feedback from users, figure out what they need, what they want, then do that, release it. Again, test, talk to users, keep going, keep moving forward. Second part, building a business around your plugin. And uh, there are other people here who, uh, who have given uh, you know, some great advice and will. The biggest question for me is what problem do you solve better than anyone else? And uh, you know, you, you need to figure that out before you get started. And we've, we've gone over that today a little bit, but it's an important thing to keep thinking about. Figure out the business model that works for you. Bryce loves premium, uh, and for good reason, right? That's, that's uh, you know, really a powerful model here. Uh, pay for the plugin, a premium model, that's worked really well for plugins like Backup Buddy and Gravity Forms. Uh, you can pay for support, either per incident or per year. Like Bryce mentioned, not, not my favorite model. Uh, but paying for upgrades has really worked well, especially for plugins coming onto the scene in the last couple of years. The other thing to look at there is creating extensions for plugins that are out there. Uh, one example with Ninja Forms about uh, two years ago, I spent four hours creating an add-on for Ninja Forms and sent it over to them. They put it up on the store. I still get 70 or $80 a month off of it, which for four hours of work to get 80 bucks a month two years later, not a bad return on investment. And if you can do that two or three times a month, just imagine as those numbers start to add on to each other, uh, it would be a, a cool way to go. For me, uh, the, the type of market and the type of product that I'm most interested in are plugins that are API reliant. So I'm not talking about plugins where you build an API just so that you can make sure that people are paying for it. I'm, I'm talking about plugins that leverage the power of multiple sites, that leverage the power of cloud data, uh, all of that to be able to create a better user experience. Those are the type of products that really get me excited. We do that with Jetpack. One of the best examples in Jetpack is related posts, where we take uh, our customers' posts, we offload them onto uh, uh, our servers and do all of the magic to compute related posts and send it back. It saves the customer a lot of, uh, a lot of computing time uh, and makes for a really good user experience. And as a plugin developer, 
it allows you to have more information about your users. When someone goes and they download your plugin from the, uh, the plugin repo, you don't know who they are and they don't have to tell you. But once they need to get an API key from you, you've started a conversation. Next step is to build your user base. So you've built a plugin. I like to step things up in three phases. So the first is going to be a small trusted group. That might be a local group. Uh, here, you know, the people who are physically in this room, your friends on the internet, the people who you've met at other WordCamps, so on and so forth. But you want this to be a small trusted group of people, uh, people who aren't going to be, uh, you know, out there blasting you on the internet when your plugin doesn't work quite right. Because it's new. You're trying to figure out what the issues are. As that small trusted group is giving you good feedback and things are going well, you can take the step to phase two. Broader community. Go out to WordCamps. Put out the word on Twitter. Uh, you know, try and get more and more users and build that, that user base. Once you have, you know, whatever your target number of users is. Uh, for me, this would probably be, you know, five to 10,000 users who are actively using it and have given you feedback then it's time to look at going into phase three, which is getting it out to uh, really the, the world, right? So this is when you look at talking to WP Tavern and Torque or uh, you know, TechCrunch, whoever it is who you want to, uh, to try and help get the word out to your potential users. Uh, so contact the media. It's pretty easy to do, and most, uh, most blogs are always looking for content. And so if you're solving a unique problem in a unique way, uh, it's pretty easy to get coverage there. Uh, Facebook advertising can be really good for targeting a specific niche, uh, sponsoring WordCamps. You can see how many companies keep sponsoring WordCamps over and over again. They don't just do that because they love the community. They also do it because it works. Uh, and then at this point in time, then it's time to start thinking about really SEO uh, optimizing and moving into search engine marketing. The most important thing you can do throughout this whole process is taking your users from just being uh, consumers into being promoters. Your reputation is paramount. Once people start uh, you know, getting a, an ugly taste in their mouth for your company, you have an uphill battle to fight. If you think about companies like GoDaddy who maybe uh, made some questionable decisions in the past, they've done a lot to try and get their reputation back, but it's, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, so make sure that you're making good decisions uh, along every step of the way. Communicate with your users. So this is your chance to create personal connections. Support is a great opportunity to do this. You need to know how you're improving the lives of your users. And the only way to do this is to talk to them. So when you get a support request, when you have an opportunity to reach out to people, do it. If you have an API-driven product and you have an email list, reach out to them. Uh, but don't do it in a spammy, salesy way. Say, hey, you know, I want you to be my partner in building this plugin. Can you let me know how I'm helping you? And demonstrate how your plugin is helping. With Brute Protect, one of the most successful things that we did was to show users on their dashboard how many potential attacks we've blocked. And that created this feeling in users, hey, you know, I'm not seeing anything from Brute Protect other than the fact that in the last week they blocked 150,000 potential attacks. I'm surely not going to uh, uninstall it, and I'm also going to put it on every site I use in the future. Engage your users. Again, same as above. Do those little things that create a connection between you and your users. Be a person, not a, uh, an unknown corporation. Uh, have fun with things. MailChimp does a great job of this with, uh, you know, funny quotes, uh, monkey videos, all sorts of good stuff. If you build a product that people love, they will sell it for you. So when you can create that emotional connection with your users, your users are going to do the hard part of the marketing for you. And potential new customers are going to trust a recommendation from an existing user way more than they trust you. Because you have something to gain, that user is just trying to, trying to spread the word about something they love. Support your plugin. Prioritize support. So make sure that you are uh, you know, 
not letting your support queue times get way up there. Use that as an opportunity to uh, interact well, as you heard earlier today. This is a, really a chance to create happiness uh, for your users. Uh, and it gives you a rare chance to have personal interaction with your users. It's a golden opportunity to create promoters. I can't tell you how many times uh, over the course of my career I've been approached by someone who's had a big problem with, uh, you know, a, a plugin. Maybe it broke their site. Maybe it caused, uh, you know, any one of a number of issues. And by talking to them, understanding their issue, showing them how I can help them, how we can help them, and how we really want to make their life better, they end up being the strongest promoters that we can have. So it's really an opportunity.